Okay, welcome. We're going to drag our aching, weary bodies through the finish line in just 100 more minutes of Physics 2A. We're down to the last 100 minutes. Okay, so welcome back. Uh, it's good to see everyone in all your shining, smiling faces. Everybody looks completely decrepit. Uh, I know it's the end of the quarter, it's summertime, I know everybody wants to be out in the sun, I do too. Uh, we're almost done. So today's going to be the last hurdle. Next class, I promise you, will be a lot better, a lot more fun. This one will be kind of cool. We're going to continue on. This is the last topic we'll really cover. Um, like I said last time, uh, IE valves, please do them. They're important for us. They're important for feeding back how to improve the course. I've used them in the past to improve this course as I go. I hope to do that again. But at the same time, it's also a nice place to say nice things. So, you know, just saying. Okay, next one, final exam. So just a few comments. On Thursday, which is tomorrow, from 7.30 to 9.30, there will be a review session by Nick. This is in Sky 110. Okay, so Sky Hall 110. This is probably the most valuable review session you'll be able to go to, right? I would say that SIs generally do a way better job than the rest of the, the course staff. I don't hold review sessions because it's not usually that good when the professor does it, because you know what I'm going to review. It's already in the lectures. Uh, your TA will have office hours all this week, a whole bunch next week. There's something like eight or 12 hours of office hours. So start studying now. Start asking questions now. Start getting on top of the subject matter. Okay, the final exam will be long. It's a three hour time period, so it's going to be maybe not three times as big, but a long exam. It covers everything, every single topic. I think the best way to figure out which topics you can cover is to go through the lectures and just look at what we covered. If you see something in the in, that's in the textbook, or maybe you did a problem in the text that does not show up in the lectures, it probably won't be tested. The emphasis will really be on the material, the subject matter, and the content of the lectures, and then problem solving around. Okay? So some of the topics I had you kind of do a few homework problems that you had maybe self-study and read, those probably won't be covered. Uh, the final exam will be next Tuesday at 3 to 6 p.m. Please don't miss it. Double check, triple check. Make sure that you're here. Bring all the normal things, and we'll be done after that. So at 6 p.m., plan a big party and then carry on with your life, okay? But let's do this last topic. These are the last few things we're going to talk about. We understood, I think pretty well, most of us understood kinetic and potential energy. So we really examined potential energy quite a bit last time. We're going to continue to examine it, but understand it in a slightly different way. So the intuition you'll have is probably useful, but we're going to look at it a bit differently in terms of the graphical analysis. So we're going to understand this thing called energy diagram. And this is basically a way to mathematically or graphically represent how particles move, so mechanics. And then using this, the second part of the lecture, at the very end, we're going to unlock the power of the atomic nucleus. So we're actually going to understand a little bit about nuclear physics by understanding classical mechanics. Kind of surprising. But let's carry on where we left off. This is where we left last time. We all answered this one. I'm going to deliver it again. So take a minute, this is the same exact problem that we ended on, essentially. And it's a small child slides down these four frictionless slides, A to B. Each has the same height, break and order, the speed, her speed at the bottom of each slide. Okay? So they all start at a height H, and conservation of energy tells us something about their speed when they get to the bottom. So again, 30 seconds. About 10 seconds left. I have about 100 responses, so that's a big chunk of people. Almost everybody. Okay, a few more seconds. If you haven't done it, go for it. Okay, awesome. I'm going to stop it here. 90% of you. So 90% of you. Unanimous said A, that their speeds are the same. Is somebody willing to volunteer why that's true? Why are their speeds the same? They all have the same height. They all have the same height, but what does that mean? They all 
have the same potential energy. So all of these children, or the child doing it four different slides, all started with the same potential energy, and that potential energy converts into kinetic energy. The same kinetic energy, right? We're going to see that what these things are, these little pictures that I've drawn, are exactly identical to the mathematical representation we'll call an energy diagram. We'll see this today. Now, here was the one we actually left with. So, again, same idea. Four different ramps, four different colors. All the same balls, the same mass, identical spherical metal ball. Starts from rest at the same height and rolls without sliding on four different shaped ramps, all ending at the same lower height. Okay? The question is, which ramp will the ball take the longest time to descend? Okay? Take a minute. You can either use your intuition, if you have an intuition for this, or you can try to use physics, which you are starting to develop an intuition for. Okay, take a few more seconds. See if you can give me an answer. Which one will take the longest time to descend? Okay, I'm going to stop. I see what happens almost every single time. So 40% of you said E, that it's the same, that all of them take the same amount of time. So E says they're all the same. The rest of you, about 60%, said A, that this one, the top one, <coughs> takes the longest time to get down. Okay? Who's willing to answer and argue their point? This is always the, the reluctant part. Think about what would happen intuitively. If I got on a slide like this, at what point would this slide start making me go fast? Two-thirds of the way down, right? It would be boring, 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 and then, okay, there's a little bit of fun, but it wasn't that great. What about this one? It would be fast at first, and then kind of the same speed, basically, the whole way across. Okay? What about these other ones? Somewhere in between. Okay? So the question is not what we asked a second ago, which is what are the speeds? Conservation of energy tells us that the speeds have to be the same on all four of these, right? The speed at the bottom has to be the same. But the time taken is not actually accounted for in conservation of energy. Let me just look at this equation. If I write down the total energy that you start with, imagine, what, is, what can you write down as the total energy you would start with at the top of a ramp of type H? Your total energy, do you have kinetic energy at the top? No, it's all potential. Okay? So your total energy would be something like m times g times h, the height. What happens to that energy as you start to move? It turns into kinetic energy, right? Do you see in this equation any time? Does time show up in conservation of energy? Nowhere. Okay? When we think about conservation of energy, time, it does not keep track of time. We'll see this more and more today. How, what do we do to keep track of time when we think about motion of objects? What is it called when we keep track of time? Kinematics. Okay? If I were to really carefully solve this problem and say, I start with an initial velocity, I have an acceleration, and then I move over some period of time that's at a given velocity or a changing velocity, I would in fact find that this one takes the longest. Okay? Even though the speeds at the bottom are the same, it matters how long you spend at that speed. Look at this one in D. I would go really fast, and then I would keep that high speed the whole way across the slide. I would move really quickly. This would be the shortest track. This one, I keep a really low speed, and then I speed up right at the end. So I take forever, and then I speed up right at the end. I ask which one's the longest, and it's the top one. Let's actually do it. 
So we can do this. We have all four of these ramps. I'm going to actually move this so you can hear it. Try to keep track. You'll hear little ticks. You've got to keep your eyes on it. Well, this red ramp always has problems. I don't like to start. It looks so good. Get ready. I'll let them go. Keep a close eye. Which one got down first? The blue. Which one got down last and really late? The red. Okay. That's because kinematics tells us that, basically kinematics tells us about the time taken at a given velocity with a given acceleration. Our energy equations have no notion of time. Okay? There is no time that shows up in this equation. It gives us speeds, it gives us heights, and it gives us mass. Okay? We're going to see this again and again. Let's go on. This is, now we have a, a, a chance. We're going to come back to this here's little picture. But now we're going to understand this in a very different way. Let me plot this before it gets too complicated on the board. I'm just going to plot energy versus the height y. Okay, forget about that picture for a second up there. Just think about this for a second. If I take an object, okay, this piece of chalk, I'm going to call this zero. This is the zero of my potential energy. And I'm going to throw the object up in the air. Okay? What happens as it goes up? What happens to its potential energy as it goes up? It increases, right? The potential energy, how does it scale with height? It goes as mgy, okay? So if I wanted to draw a line on here, here's zero. I would draw a line that looks like this. That's my potential energy. Does that make sense? As I increase in height, I increase in potential energy. Okay? If I start, again, from free fall, there's some position here, zero, and I throw it up and it stops. What is, it, what is true at that point? The kinetic energy is what? Zero. And the potential energy, is it at its minimum or its maximum? Maximum. maximum. Okay? So it reaches a point where the potential <coughs> energy makes up all of the energy. So I can actually draw another line here. Of the stuff. That the total energy in a conserved system is a constant. Right? The total energy is a constant. What this plot is saying is that as I go up in elevation, my potential energy goes up and up and up until it gets to the point where it can't go up anymore because there's no more energy in the system. Where did that total energy come from when I throw this chalk up in the air? Where does it come from initially? My hand, but well, what's what's the type of energy that it starts with? Kinetic energy, right? So the total energy that I put into this chalk system is kinetic energy. That energy goes down as the potential energy goes up. There comes a point where the potential energy it gets to a stopping point, and it's all potential energy. Okay? We're gonna give this point a name, and you'll see this over and over again. This point where it stops. It's going to be called a turning point. You see that that's where the chalk basically stops, turns around, and then comes back. Okay, that's called the classical turning point. So that's what this plot is showing. Kind of a more complicated way with a lot more stuff on it. Here's the energy plotted as a function of distance. Here's that line that I drew, the gravitational potential energy. And we're going to have to start thinking this way the way you do this is that you see that the sum up to the total energy, so here's this constant line of total energy, the sum of the potential energy plus the kinetic energy always equals the total energy. In a conserved system, I can always look at this line and ask, where is the kinetic energy bigger or smaller? In this, in this plot, which is bigger, the kinetic energy of 1 or the kinetic energy of 2? Which is the larger kinetic energy? 1. What does that mean about how fast it's moving? Is it moving faster or slower? Faster. Okay? So all of that information about free fall is embedded in one single picture. Everything you need to know. And what we call this is an energy diagram. So we plot typically the potential energy and the total energy. 
And we know that the kinetic energy just comes from the difference of the two. So gravitational potential energy is an easy one because it's a straight line with a slope mass times g, right, this constant. And in this graph, the intercept is zero. When I'm at the ground, I, when I call my zero, the zero of potential energy, that's zero on this plot. Does that make sense? It's pretty straightforward, but you see that it contains all the information we need. If I told you that you're at a height of y1, you can immediately read off of this plot both the potential and the kinetic energy. It's all encoded and embedded in this very simple line. And the total energy is always going to be a horizontal line since the mechanical energy is conserved. Right? So it's a really simple concept, but you're going to see that it gets more and more complicated. This is one of the ways that a lot of problems can be solved very easily if you understand it. So let's just look at a cartoon of exactly what I said. Here's an energy diagram for this free fall. I start from zero. I have an initial speed, which means I'm all kinetic energy, no potential energy. That's this point down here. I'm all kinetic, for those of you that like bar graphs, I'm zero potential. The particle's projected upward, it's all speed. It's the, it's the energy of movement. I then start to go up. What happens in free fall? You know this really well from exam one and two. As I throw this ball up, the speed gets closer and closer to zero. It actually decreases. There's the vector for the velocity, it's shrinking. As I go up, and so I'm moving along this line. Along the line, I am now some potential energy, some kinetic energy. I get to the top, and at the turning point, the special point where all of the energy, so the total energy is all in the potential, that's called the turning point. The thing stops. What do we know about the acceleration at this point? Which direction and magnitude is the acceleration? Excellent. You remember, it's always down in this problem. So the thing goes for a turning point, and then comes back down. Do you see that there's no sense of time in this plot? I could just imagine my throw is taking this point up to the top and then back down. It doesn't have any knowledge of time. I could do this a million times. I could say, oh, do it over and over again. It could be in forward or reverse. If I gave you this last plot that you're at this height, and you have this kinetic energy and that potential energy, you have no idea whether it's going up or down. Is that true? If I just gave you this, could you tell me whether this ball is going up or down? No. You only know about its speed and its height. You have no idea where it's going next from a plot like this. Time is not encoded in these graphs, but they're still useful. So energy conservation doesn't keep track of time. It doesn't care. Kinematics keeps track of time. If you want to know more about how long something takes or how it's accelerating, that's why we did kinematics. The energy diagram doesn't keep track of it either. You cannot tell strictly from an energy diagram whether I'm moving up or down or any other direction. In physics, we call this time reversal invariance. This quantity, energy, total energy, does not know whether I'm moving forward or backward in time. This will become important later. Here's a really simple problem that some of you have probably experienced in your life. A roller coaster. This is a particularly boring roller coaster, but it is basically the essence of every single roller coaster. This roller coaster of some mass m rolls without friction. Okay, so it has a track that looks just like this. In, I delivered the question already, three responses even before I got to the question. What minimum kinetic energy do I need in order to make it over this hill that's of height h. Okay? So I start off with some amount of energy. I start off with some potential energy. I'm going to call zero the ground. And if, has everyone ever been in a roller coaster where it actually launches you? Some take you in a chain up the little hill. Others just shoot you out of the, out of the shed. That's what this one's doing. You start with some kinetic energy, and it asks, how much do I need to get up to the top of this hill? You already have some energy because you have potential energy. So go ahead, take another minute. If, if you can do this with energy conservation, so looking at the total energy and asking how much energy before and how much energy after, or if you can intuit from the things that are shown in the picture.
Okay, take a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to stop. Ready? A lot of them are in. This is good. Only about 10% of you are seeing as usual. Okay. Here's what we say. If you look at this, and I think, let me just double check. Yes, okay, good. 89% got this one right. So the, the way, there are many different ways to do this, but it all comes down to conservation of energy. I already have here how much potential energy. What's the quantity of potential energy? Mg little h, right? Because I'm at a height h. The question is, how much energy do I need to get to the top? And do you remember in this diagram, what that's asking is, if I want my total energy, if I want my total energy to be high enough to get to the top of that hill, how much is the difference between where I am and where I need to go? And what's the answer? Shout he wrote C. It's this height difference, h minus little h. Okay? But do you see that in this picture, just look at this for a second. In this picture of you know, the roller coaster, I've just drawn an energy diagram. And basically, you calculated the kinetic energy, which is the difference between the total energy that I want to get to the top of the hill and the potential energy that I started. Okay? So, this is in principle, when you look at a roller coaster, you're looking at a gravitational potential energy diagram. Every roller coaster. Okay? Let's look at one more. See, this one should be easy now. So do the next one. Again, this one, from what you said, should be easy. So take about 45 more seconds, so about a minute total. So the question in this one, and once I'm up there, how much kinetic energy does the car then have when it reaches the bottom of the hill? Okay, take another 10 seconds. Okay, I'm going to stop. Get those last few in. There were a couple more. Okay, I see them. Good. Okay, let me ask a question before I tell you what people answered. I start at the top of this hill with total energy, right? I end at the bottom of the hill. What's my potential energy at the bottom? Zero. What is the difference between the total energy that I started with and the energy at the bottom, which was zero? How high was the change in height? Capital H. So how much energy did I just gain in kinetic energy? I start with nearly none. I go down this hill. And then I'm going really fast with your kinetic energy of what? One half mv squared, which is equal to mg capital H. The answer here is that the kinetic energy that I gain when it reaches the bottom is the total height of that hill. That's why hills are good on roller coasters. Okay? But look, let's look at this another way. Just a second. We just said, you told me that in order to get up this hill, I had to put in energy h minus little h. You said c. So I had to put in a little bit of kinetic energy. But then when I got over the hill, how much energy did I get out? Right? I put in a little bit to so my little booster, put this car up to the top of that hill. Did I get more kinetic energy or less kinetic energy when I came out the other side? Look at it. Let's look at the quantities. You said that this was mgh is how much I got. How much did I have to put in? MGH minus H. This is a really weird system. Looking from the outside, this says that if I put in a little bit of kinetic energy, I can actually build a roller coaster to give me a lot for free. 
where essentially the gravitational field is giving me kinetic energy. Doesn't that seem weird to you? I can put in a little bit of energy, but out comes a ton. Okay? We're going to see that this is identical to nuclear fusion or fission. When I split or combine an atomic nucleus, I put in a little bit of energy, I get the energy high enough to get over a hill, and when it goes down, it goes into cascade and I get nuclear energy out. Okay? So this idea that I can put a little bit in but get a lot out is completely classical. And it depends on the shape of this thing. But before we understand that, let's look at another one. This is elastic potential energy. Okay, we talked a little bit about springs. Now we're going to kind of... This will hurt for the next slide or two. Because this is what you'll need to do a lot more of in physics 2B and C. Here's a spring. We all know how these work. Here's an example. Here's a heavy mass. I can basically find an equilibrium displacement. We've done this many times. And I know that it always wants to restore back to that equilibrium. So if I lift this mass up, which way is it going to go? To restore back to equilibrium? Yeah. Down. And it's going to oscillate. Eventually, it's going to lose energy completely and come back to equilibrium. Okay? This restoring force wants to just keep pulling it back towards zero as I lose energy from the system. Okay? So when we look at this, we've, we've done this before. I have an equilibrium position. And I can squeeze the spring, I can compress it, and I change its length. What would we say if I compress a spring that's sideways like that, and I force it to be compressed, which direction does it want to push? To the right. Have I put kinetic energy in or potential energy in? It's potential. It's storing energy in the fact that I've compressed the spring. I didn't work on it, I moved it to get there. It now has potential energy. The same thing, it passes through the equilibrium position, just like this thing going up and down, passes right through the equilibrium. Do you see that at that point, what's it have mostly? Potential or kinetic energy. So in, in, in this example, if it moves through its equilibrium position, it's going as fast as possible. As it tries to stop, it's going as fast as possible right through equilibrium. It's going from stored potential energy to the kinetic energy of that mass swinging through its equilibrium position. So to study this, we can use Newton's law. This is, again, getting into some integral integration. If you take the sum of forces on that sphere, it's going to be mass times acceleration. I'm just using S as a generic coordinate for displacement, so not x, y, z, just S. And we know that in a spring, we have this thing called Hooke's law, that the force due to a spring is proportional to a spring constant and how far you displace it. If I squeeze it a lot, I have a larger force that wants to push me back. Okay? That was just folks a lot. We've done that quite a while ago. Now, acceleration, we know, is defined as the change in velocity with respect to time. Right? This is week two. You've seen this. This is nothing new. Now, algebraically, or in calculus, you can do a little trick where I multiply the top and bottom of this by one. So I get dv ds ds dt. Do you see that the two differentials, as long as they're full differentials, not partials, you can multiply top and bottom by the same number. They divide out. It's just multiplying by one. This thing, ds dt, is just the velocity. Right? It's the change in s with respect to time. And then I have the change in velocity with respect to that displacement. Now I can rearrange. Right? I have mass times acceleration. Now I've written down acceleration in this funny way. I write mvs dvs. That's just coming from mass at the top, the acceleration that I just wrote. And then let me see if this works. Yeah, good. I'll use my mouse because the, the laser seems to be dying. I have then this, this term, this spring constant times the, the displacement, Hooke's law, and I've just multiplied this ds over to the right. Now, why would I set an equation up to look like this? I have differentials on both sides, and I have some quantity that depends on the same constant. Are you familiar with this? It's because I want to integrate both sides. I basically built the differential form of this equation to then get an integral out. Again, in physics 2b and 2c, you'll derive more and more of everything that you do exactly how we just did it. You'll build a differential equation, and then you'll integrate both sides. If I integrate the, the, the left side, I get something that should look familiar. This thing in the middle, 1 half mv final squared minus 1 half mv initial squared. What is that? mv squared, 1 half mv squared is? 
kinetic energy. This is just the difference in kinetic energy. So when I integrate the left side, I get the difference in kinetic energy. I can integrate the right side. It's a simple integral, and I'll just give you the answer. That the difference in kinetic energy on the left is just equal to the difference in this quantity that goes as k delta s squared. From energy conservation, what do we know? The difference in kinetic energy in a conserved energy system is equal to the difference in potential energy, right? If I change kinetic energy and the energy is conserved, it's turning into potential. So this second half, the stuff on the right, is basically being able to rearrange where I have the final state on the left. So I have one half mv's final squared. I have this other term that goes as ks squared. On the left, again, the final displacement squared, and it equals the initial kinetic energy plus this other term. This other term is what we're going to call elastic potential energy. Okay? One thing you know from something that's squared, if I have a displacement, let's say I take this spring, and I, I take the spring at front equilibrium, and I squeeze it, I pull it up. Its displacement is positive. If I go from here and I displace it down, what is its displacement? Negative, right? We have a positive and a negative sign. When we looked at Hooke's law, that told us whether the force was positive or negative. It's always restoring it back to equilibrium. In, in energy, we don't have to keep track of the sign of the force anymore. Energy is a scalar quantity. It says whether I compress the spring by a distance s, or I extend the spring by a distance s, I store the same amount of energy, one half k s squared. Okay? So elastic potential energy is the energy stored in this spring. So I plotted this before. Let me redraw it so you see it in this case. Let me find the eraser. So if I plot again, just like we did at the very, very beginning, I plot an energy, and I'm going to call this S, and I start at an equilibrium position, zero. What does this function look like? If I plot the potential energy on an energy position graph, what does this function look like? It goes as S squared. When I have a function S squared, what is it shaped like? Parabola, right? So if I increase S or I go the other way, I have a parabolic shape. Okay? The potential energy of the spring forms this parabolic shape. If I, put, if I squeeze the spring, my potential energy goes up. If I stretch the spring, my potential energy goes up the same way. It's a para parabolic curve. So if I show you this on the screen, you'll see it at the top left. Just like I drew before, I have a total energy scale, and then my potential energy is this big bowl. What would happen if I put a marble? If I put a marble in something like this, and I put it right here on the left, what would happen to that marble? It would roll down and then roll back up. And it would roll down and roll back up. So when I look at this energy diagram, this is equivalent to thinking about the potential energy landscape of a marble in a bowl. Do you see that that tracks exactly what the spring does? If I have a spring being pulled side to side, it comes back and forth to those classical turning points. So when I think about this energy diagram, you can see all of the same things we saw before. The particle gains kinetic energy as the spring and loses potential energy. At the end points, it's all potential energy. When it moves through the middle, it's going as fast as possible. And so it's all kinetic. So there's the example. As it moves to the equilibrium position, again, you'll see this. Here's the equilibrium position. I'll mark it. When it moves past that point, that's where it's moving its fastest. Okay? Here's another example that looks pretty similar. When I swing a pendulum, there's a turning point. It gets to one end and stops. As it goes through the middle, it's moving through its fastest point. So it's moving with high kinetic energy through the classical zero, and it's stopping at what we call the classical turning point. So do you understand that now? So if I plot energy as a function of position as a little bowl, what would happen eventually if energy of this marble is slowly being lost? 
and I'm swinging this spring back and forth, or this pendulum back and forth, what's going to happen eventually? You're all going to walk out of here uh, hypnotized. You love physics, <laughs> and you will evaluate me highly, right? No. What will happen? What will happen in time? If we sat here and walked for the next 30 minutes to this bowling ball, what's going to happen? It's going to slow down. Why does that happen? Energy is leaving the system through various things. In this case, there's some air resistance. There's friction in the, the rope where it connects. Eventually, energy leaves the system. In this plot that we show on the screen, that point eventually settles where? At the, at the equilibrium point, right in the bottom. So it's kind of intuitive to stare at these graphs. As I lose energy, as the total energy gets lower and lower and lower, I have fewer and fewer points on this graph that I occupy. I eventually get to the equilibrium point right at the middle. So I can give you a really complicated picture of energy versus position. And I plot the potential energy, and the total energy is a constant. How would a particle behave? If I've got a classical particle that starts from rest in the top left, what would happen to it? Just imagine a marble on a, on a, 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 a sliding board like this. What would happen first? It would start to move. It would take that potential energy and it would convert it into kinetic energy. It would speed up. What happens as it goes to that bowl and then gets to the other side? Slows down. It turns some of that kinetic energy back into potential energy. Then it gets over the bump, just like a roller coaster. And then what? Speeds up again. Okay? And then slows down on the other side. It gets all the way to the top, and if energy is conserved, it turns around and does it again. Okay? So do you see how these plots work? They tell us how an object's kinetic energy and potential energy are changing as a function of position. Now, again, let's look at the total energy that I've drawn there at the top. You would see this thing just going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, infinity. Right? It would never stop if you had conservation. There's a point here where the speed is the maximum. Why is that point that I've shown the maximum speed? Because it's all kinetic energy. I have zero potential. It's all kinetic. And so now, here's a way to think about equilibrium. We already have to understand from springs. Let's say that I take a particle with total energy E2. You see the bottom line of this plot? So I take a total energy of E2. If I put that particle right here on the left bowl, will it go anywhere? No. It has nowhere to go. Its total energy is stuck in this little bowl. If I had enough energy to push it over that hill, just like the roller coaster, it could then go down in this bowl and roll back and forth. Okay? So the particle can be at rest at x2, but it cannot move away from x2 because it's locally in a little bowl. It doesn't have enough kinetic energy to get out. And so this is what we called in mechanics when we talked about Newton's laws and dynamics. This is what we call static equilibrium. This is equivalent to Newton's static equilibrium. There's nowhere for this object to go when its energy is stuck. If you give it a total energy slightly more than E2, it will oscillate just like the spring, right? It will roll around side to side in that bowl. And an equilibrium for which small disturbances cause oscillation. So imagine, here's a, a, a system. Where's the equilibrium position of this bowling ball on a rope? It's right here. If I move it a little bit and I let it go, what's it do? It oscillates about that minimum, okay? That's called a stable equilibrium. But oddly, there are other positions on this graph. So does that make sense? If it oscillates, that's stable. It wants to eventually go back. But there's another one. If you look at x3, if I gave you exactly the energy E3, see, I, I go to this energy, I go right to the top of the hill. It's all potential energy. It's effectively zero. What would happen if I nudged an object that was sitting at the top of that hill either way? It would roll away, right? It would never come back. But is it in equilibrium? Sure. If I put it right at the top of that hill and balanced it perfectly, it would be in equilibrium. Okay? Think about what I'm doing when I'm standing here. Am I in a stable equilibrium or an unstable equilibrium? If you came over and pushed me over by 45 degrees, what would happen to me? I would fall. I would not oscillate 
back and forth. What are those things called that do that? You punch them and they go boom, boom. Everyone had these when they were like four. What are these called? You know what I mean? It's like a sandbag on the bottom of an inflatable little person and you hit it and you go boom, boom, boom. That's in a stable equilibrium. We are not. We are unstable equilibrium creatures, right? Almost everything we do is in an unstable local equilibrium. So do you see that the part of what rests at x3 does not move away from x3? It's still in static equilibrium, but if you give it a little more energy, it's going to speed up and go away. It will never come back to that same position. This is called an unstable equilibrium. Right? Does that make sense? If I, if I get pushed and I oscillate back and forth to where I started, I'm stable. If I get pushed and I roll away, I'm unstable. Here's another really good example of unstable equilibrium. Has anyone ever done this? Is it stable or unstable? Un Extremely unstable. Okay. Is this one stable or unstable? Stable. stable. Eventually, it stops swinging and comes right back to where it was. Here's a trick. Who's ever? filled up their coffee right to the very brim of the cup. Mm -hmm. And you walk around campus early in the morning, you're like, ah, it's like burning your hand and spilling out. Yeah. Okay. Where do you hold a really full coffee cup so that it doesn't do that? Do you hold it at the bottom, like this? No. Okay, I'm going to keep the coffee in there, I'm going to keep it in there. No, you hold it right at the top. It's in a stable equilibrium when you hold the top of the cup. All of you are going to change your life today. You're going to walk out of here without any third degree burns on your hand anymore because you're going to hold the coffee, coffee cup from the top, not from the bottom. Okay? That's because the coffee cup, when it's held from the top, is in a stable equilibrium. When you hold it from the bottom, it's an unstable equilibrium. It'll do okay. Did you ever go to a picnic and they do this race where they have you hold a bowl of water filled to the top? Oh, we should do it again. Maybe right before the final. We'll have a race. You take a really shallow but big bowl, you fill it right to the brim, and you have people run across the stage and whoever gets the most water to the other side wins. It's not easy. And it's because you're in a very unstable equilibrium. It's a lot of fun. So here we go. We're going to unlock the power of the nucleus for this last few minutes. So how do we understand nuclear fission and fusion as physicists? It all comes from this idea of energy diagrams. So look at this problem. This should be pretty straightforward. I'm going to launch it, but then I'll ex examine it. Here's a picture of what the potential energy diagram is for the interaction between a proton and an atomic nucleus. Okay? What is nuclear fusion? Is anybody familiar? What does fusion of something mean? Come together. What is fission? Rip apart. When I think about what's going on in the sun, it's a constant, equilib almost equilibrium of nuclear fusion and fission. Some small atomic nuclei are coming together, and some are falling apart. In both cases, energy comes out. So here's a position. This is what it looks like when a proton has to get added to a nucleus. And it's as a function of the radius, how far from the center of the nucleus. So the question is, which position R is a point of unstable equilibrium? If I imagine putting a particle right in that position and then deviating it anywhere, it would roll always away from that position. So take another 30 seconds, just from what we said. Unstable equilibrium means that it will have a speed that moves it away from that position. Take another 20 seconds. I see about 100 responses. OK, a few more seconds. The last couple. OK, I'm going to stop. Get them in. There we go. Saw the last few hit. OK. The choice that I got most was four femtometers. Are you familiar with femtometers? I guess I should have prefaced that. You don't know what a femtometer is? Okay, 
Do you know what a millimeter is? Okay. Go three orders of magnitude more. What's below a millimeter? Micrometer. What comes after a micrometer? Nanometer. What comes after a nanometer? Picometer. I have friends with cats named Pico and Nano. All physicists, weirdos. After that comes Femto. It's trillions of a meter. What's the answer, though? Everybody got it. It's C. It's at the top of that hill. Wait, one more. Just to make sure, which position R is a point of stable equilibrium? Tread carefully. What does it mean to be in stable equilibrium? Think of this bowling ball on a road. Take about 20 more seconds. Think about what would happen if I find a, a particle at a point and I nudge it away. Will it come back? That's what it means to be in a stable equilibrium. Which of these positions is a stable equilibrium? <laughs> Okay, 10 more seconds before you run off. Get the last couple in. Okay, I'm gonna stop. Here's what I've got. So the majority of you, 44%, but still a majority, said that it would happen at one femtometer. If I put a particle with one femtometer and I nudged it, would it ever come back? Never. It's not stable unless it lives in a bowl. Where is there a place that looks like a bowl on this plot? Nowhere. Now wait, what's the answer then? E, before you run off, let me say one more thing. This diagram is the basis of most chemical reactions. It's the basis of most nuclear interactions. Look at what happens. If I rip apart an, a, a, a nucleus or a molecule, I rip it out of that nearby position and as they come far away, I gain kinetic energy. Just like that roller coaster. I put a little bit in, I get a lot out, that's fusion. I rip it apart, I get a little bit out, that's called fission. You now understand molecules, molecular chemistry, nuclear fission and fusion, all in 50 minutes. Okay, I'll see